Hi, this is Erika Kassab from Small Robot Studio. In this lesson, I'm going to teach you how light and shadow works so you can paint it. We live in a 3D world. Nonetheless, as painters, we work in a 2D media. Going through the process of flattening an image can be quite tricky. Moreover, we represent this 3D world with lines, when there are no such things in the world. You might argue, what I see here is a line, to which I will reply. It's actually a shape, a thin shape with variation of width. It's just too small to appreciate it as a shape. We don't need lines to represent a 3D world. We need shapes. Although this shape is still flat. If we break it down assigning value, now we get a 3D geometry. This is all we need. To paint in 3D, we need to think in planes and values. Lines are not real, but they are the resource that we use to represent the edges between the shapes. Any change in value is a change of a plane. But we don't always see such dramatic edges. Sometimes we will see a soft transition of values. Not all geometries have hard corners. Some have more planes in between. The more planes there are, the softer the transition will be. When sketching, if your objective is painting light and shadow, don't settle for the main counters. Sketch the planes inside the shapes. Sure, I know they're not the prettiest sketches, but they will give me valuable information, so I know where to place my shadows. Let's carry on with shading. To recreate what our brain is looking at, we need to understand it. When light hits an object, some of this light is absorbed and some of it is reflected. Reflected light is what we see. The planes that are perpendicular to the light source receive more light and will seem brighter. The less perpendicular they become, the less light they will receive and they will start to look darker. When a plane is parallel, then the light won't hit it. If light doesn't hit it, we don't see it. But why can I still see the back of this sphere even though it's not facing the light source? This is because the light is hitting the floor as well. The light bounces off the floor, loses strength and hits the ball. It illuminates with less intensity the shadow areas. Otherwise they would be full black. This is why shadows in Spain look black, because there is nowhere for light to bounce. Objects receiving light will block the light to whatever is behind them. This is gonna create a projected shadow. What we are observing are two families, a family of light and a family of shadow. The shadow is divided in two, the shadow of the form and the projected shadow. To know their location, we need to know where the light comes from. The question now is how do I choose values? How do I know how dark or light shadows are gonna be? For this, I love the halfway to black method which Scott Robertson teaches in his book How to Render. I will take the average value, the local true value, and find it in the grayscale. My shadow value will be found halfway to black. The area between these points is a value range that I will use to paint. This also works in color. Color has brightness, so once I locate it, I will find it halfway to black. For color, there are gonna be changes in temperature and saturation, but that's for another lesson. This method assumes an, a scenario of midday sunlight with a clear sky ambient light. There are scenarios in which my shadows are gonna look darker or brighter. Still, this is a great start. We can always adjust later. For this lesson, I will be painting our beloved channel's small robot. My image is not finished, but with only two values I can already see volumes. This stage makes 70% of our image, so don't rush it. Achieve readability at this level to succeed in later stages. Let's learn more about the families of light and shadow. But before I carry on, let me take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters, because they are the reason why we keep creating free CG and illustration tutorials every week. As a reward to our supporters, we offer bonus videos, assets to download, and for those following the illustration lessons, the chance to receive feedback on their work. Sign up at patreon.com slash smallrobotstudio. We will start with the members from the family of the light. We already know that the planes perpendicular to the light source, that is, facing the light, receive more light. This will be known as the center of light. As we retreat to the planes receiving less light, the value gets darker. 
This is gonna give us a mid-tone. The mid-tone is not gonna be halfway in the value range. It's gotta be closer to the light than the shadow. This is because of the Lambert emission law. I don't wanna bore you with the physics, and there's already great videos explaining it, but I can briefly show you. In the family of light, the value changes little by little. When we get to the shadow, there's a sudden drop. We were advancing in small steps until we jump from here to here. With this in mind, I'm gonna keep painting my robot. The center of light is the area that receives more light. But why is this brighter? This is a highlight. This is a mirror light reflection of the light source. Do not confuse the highlight with the center of light. They are not the same. The highlight is also referred as the active highlight, because if we, the viewer, move, it is going to change its location. Whereas the center light is passive, because even if I move and the highlight moves, the center light is going to stay on the same place. The highlight will be on the plane that reflects the light relative to the position of the viewer. If this is confusing, think of pointing a mirror to see someone else. If me, the viewer, I'm close to the light source, the center of light and the highlight will be close together. If I am away from the light source, the highlight and the center of light were gonna be farther apart. They would only be perfectly in line if me, the viewer, is a light source. Let's move on to the family of shadows, or almost. Let's stop at the border. This is known as the Terminator. Yes, I know, a peculiar name. The Terminator can be a defined or diffuse border in different lighting scenarios. The Terminator, the light source and the projected shadows will be all connected through a line. The closeness of our light source will determine how big our projected shadow is. So far I have illustrated light sources like points, which they are not, they are also volumes. When we have a larger light source, it's more like several points of light. Each one has a different alignment to the Terminator and will define its own projected shadow. Where the projected shadows overlap, it will look darker. Where they don't, it will be brighter. These two areas in the projected shadow are called umbra and penumbra. Again, depending on the lighting scenarios, the penumbra will be a defined edge or something more diffused. Now, we already know that even shadow areas receive at least a little bit of light, or they would be full black. The darkest part of my shadow will be the areas less likely to receive bounce light rays, the least exposed. Typically, interior corners and places where two surfaces have contact. In this example where the sphere touches the ground creates the darkest shadow. These are known as occlusion shadows. Just as there are unexposed areas, we have open areas which look lighter because they are receiving reflected light. This is the name that they are known for. The area in the form of shadow that light couldn't quite reach, that's the core shadows. These are the last two members of the shadow family. Core shadows are gonna be more obvious in rounder objects. Avoid the rookie mistake of making the reflected light too bright. The key is to avoid trespassing families. Don't make it as bright as any value in the family of light. These colors belong to the shadows and they are darker. Maybe they're gonna be the brightest tone, but only in the world of the shadows. I'm gonna include this in my painting, occlusion shadows, reflected light, and core shadows. Okay, this is all very cool, but really, how can I apply this with color and maybe for characters? Let me show you a digital painting technique, which I use quite often. I start dividing my character by colors. They're all flat with no light and shadows. Then I make another layer where I paint all my shadows with one color. In this case, I'm choosing a warm color for my shadows, so my lights are gonna be a cool color. I'm gonna set this shadow layer to multiply. This blending mode is gonna merge this layer and the layer underneath, making my original flats darker. To paint brighter areas, the process is the same. Instead of choosing multiply, go for any of these blending modes. These are the ones that increase the value of colors. Together, they look like this. With this technique, you can paint light and shadow as realistic or cartoony as you want. That's it for this tutorial. If you find it useful, make sure that you leave a like so other people can find it. 
And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe as we are bringing out CG and illustration tutorials every week. Become a patron and access tutorial assets, bonus content, a private discord and more by clicking in the link below.